Hi, everyone. We just love the comics here at Words, Images, and Worlds. We love all sorts of books and glad to be talking on this episode with someone who has created in the medium of comics, and that is artist, uh, author, educator, George Pratt. George, thank you for jumping in and joining. Yeah, thank you for having me here. My pleasure. My pleasure. I will mention a couple of your titles, as I so often do at the beginning of these episodes. And then I'm curious about the the things that bubble to the surface for you in your career. I remember reading Detective Comics and Legends of the Dark Knight in the late 80s and early 90s. And every now and then I, I would find art that was just not what I was used to or not what I was expecting. It, it kind of moved in a different direction and gave some different sensibilities and that was of course your art for those books and then uh, you've also created in worlds like sandman magic the gathering um, wolverine heavy metal uh, so a variety of work that is out there yeah the well it was funny because the covers that was dc trying to keep me on the hook <laughs> worked on a, a a contract for the enemy ace war idol graphic novel uh ah. so, so that i wouldn't go to marvel or whatever <laughs> so ah. i was happy to do that because the covers that was the glory spot you know so i got to have fun doing that but i wouldn't work on that graphic novel it, it took them about a year to get me a contract for that uh which that was my first graphic novel um oh, wow. so i refused to work on it until i actually had a contract in hand so yeah yeah well, that that speaks to some of the backstory and some of the ways you have to be smart as a creator too, and uh, kind of advocate for yourself as well. Yeah, well, and that's I try, I try to tell that to my students. You know, I mean, any contract uh, is always going to be in their best interest first. You know, mm -hmm. uh, and so you have to really, uh, you know, bargain with them uh, and and try and move move the needle a little bit more your way if, if they'll if they will negotiate you know yeah. uh sometimes they're just like nope this is it take it or leave it you know <clears throat> and these days i actually uh have a lawyer look over my contracts you know just uh just to be really safe you know and i think i know pretty much uh the good and the bad but it doesn't hurt to have someone who's that's their entire world is you know contract law copyright ip all that mm -hmm. so. absolutely <laughs> yeah yeah what what connected you with art and comics how did you know that was the space you wanted to be in um well i had when i was a kid i had two open heart surgeries uh well, the first one when i was one the second one when i was five and it was uh that's when the batman tv show started and mm -hmm. so I had some, you know, couldn't tell time, but I had some unerring, you know, inner clock that was like Batman's on, you know. And mm -hmm. um, so I got hooked on that show and my family saw how into it I was. And they started buying me, bringing me comic books and that, you know, there went their pocketbook, you know. <laughs> so, right. Yeah, but that did it for me. And I, you know, I became a just a comic book junkie you know anything four color on newsprint but also i was you know i grew up surrounded by books uh my father was a uh physician and he he subscribed to everything you know like i mean the new yorker time scientific american i mean we had everything around the house national geo <clears throat> all life look all that stuff and then he was also all the paperback books you know with robert mcginnis covers uh scattered all over the house and it was just like oh my you know and uh so i was surrounded constantly and back in those days too you couldn't turn around without seeing art it was it was on all the covers of the magazines and the paperbacks and movie posters it was everywhere you know mm -hmm. um so yeah i got i got hooked really quickly uh into just collecting and and uh, my and my parents were into art they had, uh, you know, my dad was really into the Impressionists, so we had uh, Pissarro books and stuff, and they bought me, you know, Rembrandt, and I was a big Rockwell freak, you know, mm -hmm. so uh, they really encouraged uh, the art thing, even though, you know, the uh, the system 
uh, public school and all that, they really didn't, they weren't into it. They would sit there and constantly tell me I was wasting my time and mm-hmm. you're not going to amount to anything. You're a daydreamer, you're a dreamer, blah, 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 you know. So didn't stop me. <laughs> yeah. So my parents were supportive, which was cool, you know. So, but that's how I, that that's how I really uh, got into it. And, and, uh, and I had a good friend, uh, my best friend all my life up until COVID, um, who we shared all that stuff constantly. And we did our own little fanzine uh, that we put out in uh, when we were like 15 years old, uh, writing the stories and doing the art for it and all that. And um, so, yeah, it was uh, preordained, you know, <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. I was gonna. I really had a just blinders on for it, you know. And it wasn't until art school that I that it shifted. Um, actually, before art school, because of the studio book by Jeff Jones, Bernie Wrightson, Mike Kaluta, and who did I miss? Barry Windsor Smith. And um, you know, for my generation, that book was revelatory for a lot of us, you know, mm-hmm. and changed, <laughs> changed our direction that made us really, yeah, we still wanted to do comics, but we saw it totally as an art form uh, rather than just entertainment, I think, you know? Um, yeah. So, uh, and that, that actually was when I got into art school, uh, I apprenticed with Marshall Rogers and did like a lot of the coyote zip and, draw the chain link fences that he didn't want to draw and uh, we used to have these talks back and forth Uh, he had me coming into continuity associates late at night so i wouldn't have to pay rent to neil adams and Mm -hmm. it was uh and we would are you know not not argue but i saw it as an art form and marshall was like no it's just entertainment you know and Mm -hmm. that cured me of wanting to uh do regular comics just because one i didn't i know i don't have it in me to to bust out that many pages i don't have people do it you know it's like i'm in awe of anyone that can do it because it's so much work um but i was also caught up in wanting to be a painter and and sort of you know kind of move around and try everything you know not just then focus on comics um so yeah so you know the, the course got shifted in art school which i think was a good thing um and still got to do comics, but I, but I, you know, I love comics, and and but I want to do comics when I want to do them, not because I have to do them. Yeah, yeah. As you look back at the comics that you've worked on and the pieces, are there particular experiences that bubble up as being some of the the crown jewels, the the most warm, positive experiences, or just where you kind of knew that things were working? Well, you know working on you know enemy ace uh Mm -hmm. that was that was a real labor of love that book and it all and it's what gave me a career basically in within comics and illustration um dc i was amazed that they you know let me do it because uh i had no no real writing uh credits to my name and they but they like gave me the go ahead and um but they and they did leave pretty much leave me alone, you know, for that book. <clears throat> so I got to do what I wanted to do. It took three years to do the art on that thing. And they, you know, and they didn't like pester me and, and bug me constantly. I had Andy Helfer as my editor, uh, with mm-hmm. Kevin Dooley as the assistant editor, and uh they were great, you know. And um, but that whole experience was one, it was a real learning experience because the longest thing I'd done up to that point was an eight-page story for heavy metal that which was sort of my my senior project uh in art school you know so but it was also you know uh working with uh jay muth on moonshadow that mm-hmm. let me know that i could do it you know because he would call up and say hey uh i'm i'm not going to make deadline in, unless you can help me out here and so he would get me a train ticket up to uh upstate new york and we would uh we would bust an issue of moonshadow out over the weekend and i was like okay i can i can do this you know and um and i toyed around with the enemy ace project for probably like three something four years on my own just it was a little toy you know for me Uh and uh, and then scott hampton 
uh, would drive up. Uh, I was in Brooklyn and he would drive up from Columbia, South Carolina. And one time he said, Hey, you know, uh, I'm going to be at Rick Bryant's studio in Manhattan, Midtown. And uh, why don't you bring all that enemy ace stuff, you know, mm-hmm. and let me scoop it out. I was like, oh, cool. So I met him up there and uh you know, I brought this whole pile of crap. I was working. <laughs> and he goes, oh, is this all the ace stuff? I'm like, yeah. And he goes, see you later. And he walks out the door. I'm like, what are you doing? He goes, I'm going to DC. You know, if you want to be there when it lands, follow me. And he just left. Yeah. I was like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> so he walked, he, he walked in and uh, at DC and went straight to Andy Helfer. And he said, Andy, check this out. He was like, it was my sketchbooks and all kinds of stuff. And Andy was like, yeah, we want to do this. And then it was scary because it was real. You know, it was like, Oh mm-hmm. no, this was, this was my little, you know, Im- you know, imaginary friend. You know, it's like, but all of a sudden it was real and it was scary. 128 page graphic novel. But um, yeah, that, that really was like, you know, and that sort of started the whole ball going, you know, um, yeah. but it was really, what was really gratifying about it. One, you know, I was able to, I was already, you know, questioning and wanting to do stuff about Vietnam. And I, the first work I got out of school was working for a, uh, like one of those mercenary magazines mm-hmm. and the guy there, the in rent money, you know? Mm-hmm. And um, so, but I wanted to do something of my own, you know, instead of just illustrating other people's stories about Vietnam, because Vietnam scared the hell out of me as a kid. Uh, it wasn't beyond the the pale to think that I would have to go you know, my entire life up until I was, what, 15, it was, that was a reality, you know, and uh, I remember my best friend's mom constantly telling us, I'm going to shoot you in the foot so you don't have to go to this thing, and we're like, so, you know, so so I wanted to, and I was reading a ton about that stuff, and so I wanted to do something about it, and then I remembered Enemy Ace that I read as a kid that I loved because of Joe Kubert and the whole world war one thing my granddad was a a, a doughboy. boy uh, my dad was in world war ii and uh once i started reading about that man i got hooked to the on the first world war like mm-hmm. literally so it really opened all these doors and and then the the uh the people at dc i mean i was really up front i said look i don't know what the hell i'm doing <laughs> You know, so anything you can do to help me make this the best book that I can would be totally welcome. And so, man, people, you know, just were fell over themselves backwards to make that a really great experience. And um, and you find when you're working on these projects, uh, it doesn't matter. Like when I was working on Wolverine or when I was doing Batman or whatever, people come out of the woodwork. And there's this weird synchronicity that starts to click and people really want to help and, and, uh, and are excited about that material and that stuff, you know, uh, and you just find all these weird connections start popping up. It's pretty cool. So. Yeah. It was, it was a great experience. Yeah. But what is your process like taking it from the idea to the completed product? Well, like on, uh, on Batman or Wolverine, Wolverine was a very different experience and, and a really good experience. The Batman book, I I had an idea for it and went into Denny O'Neill and uh, pitched it to him. And it was uh, and he he said, well, let's well, let's go to lunch and let's talk about it. So we went and uh, and he was like, yeah, let the, the, we, let's do it. You know, and it was, uh, you know, the whole idea was Batman has this nightmare and it's the nightmare that keeps him from being from killing people <laughs> you know mm-hmm. and uh but all of a sudden the nightmare stops and he's like sort of kind of freaking out about it and starts to become a little off uh and then he gets caught up in this whole uh serial killer thing and whatever anyway uh so on that uh I take that and then write a uh a treatment you know basically a synopsis or a or a longer uh outline almost like almost like a movie script but since i'm doing it for myself i don't go the whole route on that like i don't do a panel by panel breakdown uh in writing um i have what what's what is what happened on enemy ace is i have like a 
an idea like a almost like a rhythm i you know idea of the ups and downs of where i want to take the emotional part of it uh-huh. and uh and the dialogue and stuff like that can come later um and a lot of times it's the art and the storytelling because i definitely do thumbnails you know uh-huh. um and then and then add dialogue to that and it's and that's great being the writer because things i'm really bad at like figuring out how much dialogue can fit in a panel <laughs> and so it comes up and i'm drawing it in and i'm like wow that's way too much text you know so i can like <laughs> i can like play with it and knock it down or whatever um but wolverine was uh a whole different uh thing where i was uh working on Batman. I had another two years to go on Batman and I was at, in the process of uh, leaving New York um, uh, and moving down to uh, um, North Carolina, Chapel Hill, where mm-hmm. Scott Hampton mm-hmm. was and John Van Fleet, Kent Williams. And this, there was a Richard, I mean, it was a big comic community down there. And um, I bumped into uh, Chris, uh, claremont who lived in my neighborhood i was in park slope and he's like hey i just got i just got uh made the editor of all the editors and i was like wow cool you know like awesome and he says yeah he goes you know like uh, what's up with you and i'm like ah. and i was having all these troubles <laughs> with the batman graphic novel uh just a lot of uh battling for you know how i wanted to do it as opposed to how the editor wanted me to do it and it was, you know, it just, everything was not copacetic. And, um, and he says, man, he goes, they should just let you do your thing. And I'm like, well, you know, and he goes, well, he goes, you should come work with Marvel. Yeah. And, uh, I was not, you know, I was a DC guy, you know, because they had Batman, they had Sergeant Rock, they had Swamp Thing, you know, it's like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and, uh, and I was a Wolverine fan as a kid. I loved all that. Uh, my high school days was John Byrne, X-Men. Uh, which I loved, you know, and I said, well, he goes, if you come to Marvel, it'll be hands off. And I'm like, really? He goes, yeah. And he, and I said, well, can, that was a Friday. I said, can I come in Monday? And I said, can I do Wolverine? And he goes, yeah. And I'm like, all right. And I'd been reading all this uh, Japanese ghost stories and things like that from the, like Lafcadi O'Hearn and uh-huh. really getting into it. And so, I wrote up this ghost story. Oh, and I went into the comic shop down below and uh, mentioned like, oh yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to try and do this thing with Mariko. And what, and they're like, well, Mariko's dead. I'm like, what? <laughs> it's because I hadn't <laughs> followed it. And they said, oh no, she's dead. She got poisoned or whatever. And I'm like, oh, I'm like, that's perfect. Yep, you know, yep. could be a ghost, you know? So, <laughs> so I wrote that up and took it in and Chris was like, yeah, look, we want to do it. I'm like, well, I have two more years on Batman, you know, and he goes, okay. He goes, well, we'll get the contract going when you're done with Batman, you can move right into it. I'm like, sweet. And, um, so I move, you know, get married, have a son, uh, and finish it up Batman. Mm -hmm. And, and so I call Chris, I'm like, Hey, I'm, I'm putting the finishing touches and ready to move into, you know, the next deal. And he goes, well, I got bad news. I'm like, oh, what? He goes, uh, I just got let go. And he goes, but I've given the project to Joe Casada, and he's going to baby it through. So you're in good hands. I'm like, sweet. <laughs> and um, so anyway, yeah. So for Wolverine, it was pretty amazing. Uh, you know, they had the bones of the story. And the only thing that they uh, were really involved in was the covers. Uh-huh. And um, so I, I had to draw, uh, you know, run sketches by them for the covers, but for the insides, um, I just did it. You know, um, I didn't have to show sketches and have to go through layouts or any. I just did my thing and uh, basically packaged the entire series uh, on my own and then sent them DVDs that went to the printer. Um, wow. So that was pretty cool. It's like uh, they really did. It just like, was totally hands off. Uh, And that was a, that was amazing, you know? So it really got to be what I wanted it to be. Um, But my process is to, you know, write, come up with the, with the, the storyline and then do thumbnails 
uh, -huh. layouts. And um, then I take my layouts and that's really the real work of comics for me. That's where the real hard work is done. It's the nail biting. Uh, it's trying to figure out how to best tell that story and that visually. And then I take my layouts and shoot reference i get models and and i hire models and stuff to, to play the different characters and i shoot all the reference and then then i do the art on uh, and the the shift on wolverine was when i was working on batman i did these drawings uh and i was really happy with these drawings they were in pencil uh on loose sheets you know and i was just having a ton of fun just drawing because i i have at that time i had re, you know everything was done old school uh, on full pages so like on enemy ace i would tape a panel off paint it tape another panel paint it all on the same page mm -hmm. and uh, batman was basically the same process and i had done these drawings that i was really happy with then i had to transfer them to the boards and then paint them and the the, the editor really wanted me to basically he wanted like enemy ace which it's not how i painted anymore and i was just like oh God. So, um, and I really, cause I, you know, and he says, well, yeah, I want it to be like an MEA. So I'm like, yeah, but Batman's not real. Mm -hmm, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. Batman is a character like enemy ace was basically the red Baron, you know, to me. And I said, that's, that's really based in a real world thing, you know? And I said, and so I can see that as reality, especially coupled with all the Vietnam stuff and, you know, this, this the dichotomy of the you know the uh someone in the air killing machines and someone on the ground in the tunnels face to face with killing people and i said that but they're two different things you know batman i wanted it to be really graphic in the way that i was going to draw it and paint it and they were like no oh my god so uh so when i got to wolverine and i started playing with batman where i did separate panels and then put them together in photoshop and when i got to wolverine man i just i said okay i'm just gonna i just had these cans and drawing pads had my reference that i shot and i would just dip the pen and just draw and have fun you know each panel was just a fun drawing exercise uh i got to enjoy drawing again and then i would do uh, uh i did the pen drawing and then i would do basically like sort of local color uh watercolor on top and not try to manipulate it like i did on enemy ace or the batman stuff so it was like really pretty flat tones and stuff and then i would bring in charcoal mm -hmm. on uh, soft charcoal on top of that to actually mold form you know oh, wow. um so that and it went really quickly it was like really fun and then i then i would bring them into photoshop to uh, you know piece together the pages based on my layouts but i was scanning everything at 600 dpi full size and they weren't big you know some of them were big but uh, most of the panels were 11 by 14 or something like that mm -hmm. and uh when i brought them into the page size document in quark or in photoshop <clears throat> um and dropped them into the panels since they, I had scanned them full size, they were huge, you know, right, but it was right. like, but I was seeing it. It was really fun because I was getting to see it sort of dispassionately. Uh -huh. uh, things were happening that I weren't part of my layouts. It was just because it came in large. And I was like, wow, that's actually way cooler than what I thought of when I did my <laughs> layouts. So I got to sort of play editor as if I was playing with someone else's work. And it was, it was really liberating in a way, you know, um, so that was a fun switch. And then I did all the lettering in Quark. Uh, this, this was before InDesign had even shown up. And they were wanting me to letter everything in Illustrator. And I absolutely hate that program. And, I, and they walked me through it. And it was so convoluted. I was like, I don't understand why we're doing this. Uh -huh. you know, Quark is a page layout program. That's what it does. I can letter it in Quark. They're like, oh, we don't think that'll work. I'm like, yeah, it'll work. So I did it and it was fine, you know, so, and it's yeah. so direct. You draw a box, you type it in, you're done, you know, uh, not having to do, I can't even, it was so convoluted. I was like, forget it. I'm not doing that. But anyway, um, yeah, it was just, a. but that's, that's sort of basically the process mm -hmm. of, uh, of doing it up. You know, I don't do a lot of 
like preparatory drawings or anything like that, like I did for Batman. Uh, now it's just go straight in and, you know, just have fun drawing and then put it together. Um, and if, yeah, I mean, if you want to, there's, uh, I could call up some of that if you wanted to see any of that stuff, uh, like Wolverine layouts or any of that stuff, you know, uh, yeah. I have it in PDF form that I show students, uh, every once in a while, I'll, well, I have some online classes that I teach about graphic novels and <clears throat> sequential storytelling and stuff. And then I also bring it into my, I have a sequential class I teach and I have them right. do a sequential that breaks people because they're like, they think comics are fun. And then, then we do one and they're like, Oh, <laughs> they're like, Oh my God, I don't ever want to do this again. You know, like, yeah. You got to love it, you know, cause it yeah. really is a lot of work, you know? So and then yeah. we just had fun. I was at the uh, original art expo in uh, Orlando, which was really great. It was just artists and original art and art collectors. It was mm -hmm. awesome. So uh, Adam Kuber was there, uh, Jose uh, Garcia Lopez, uh, you know, just a ton, uh, Dan Burton, a uh, ton of great, great comic artists, and uh, Adam Hughes. Uh, uh, my buddy James Martin was there, and it was, you know, it was a blast. Ben Temple Smith. I mean, just tons of, of great artists, and everybody's just having a great time and it wasn't packed aisles with mm -hmm. you know, all the other stuff that you deal with at a con you know it's just a good old time con yeah so, fun. that that actually leads to the last official question which is spaces where you like to connect either online or convention wise and then anything that is currently on your creative focus um, you know, I really don't do that many cons anymore. I get invited to festivals in Europe, which I'll never turn down a free trip anywhere. Mm -hmm. Uh, those are really a very different animal. You know, it's, there's a, a respect for art and comics, uh, as art over there that you, you don't see over here, except now at this OAX, um, that's really gratifying when you go because you're just like wow you know uh they're the everybody's not in it for the money they're mm -hmm. in it because of the love of it <clears throat> and uh and you get these you know these sketchbooks come up and <clears throat> they're like massive tomes and it, and it's obviously a family heirloom you know what i mean and you're yeah. and you know, you're expected to draw in everything for free and which is great you know it's a, there's a love of it that goes beyond just bucks you know, mm -hmm. uh, but I don't, so I haven't done a lot of cons. Uh, I quit going to San Diego years ago. Uh, it just was, you know, they just kicked all the artists to the curb and I don't know why they call it a, a comic con anymore. You know, it's cause it has really very little to do with comics, more like Hollywood con, you know, game con, whatever. But, um, so it's really, you know, Facebook, that kind of stuff it's uh uh and i miss going to the conventions and seeing people you know and hanging out but it became so onerous with you know the cost of a table the cost of the airline tickets the food the you know and it just and i never got to see the con i did i did san diego for probably like 16 something years 17 i don't know and never saw the con i was always yeah. behind the table you know uh yeah. all the time and you know and then you'd go have a nice meal with your buddies and then back to the hotel to work on your sketch list, you know, mm -hmm. uh, just constantly working. But um, yeah, so that's really uh, kind of it. And then on my plate these days, I have a show up right now here in Sarasota of uh, in 2016, I took a, uh, my first and only sabbatical after teaching since 1992 uh, wow. So my first sabbatical, I went to Morocco for two months and uh, ended up living with a Berber family in the old city of Fez and went to the Sahara and, you know, did all that stuff. And uh, so I have a show up right now of all that work, along with a lot of the photography. Um, and uh, we're trying to put a book together of that. And, and you can kind of see back here behind me, that's a John mm -hmm. Foster painting he went with me oh, for the wow. first three weeks and uh so i'm putting together a 
kind of the voyage book of all of the trip with all our sketchbook material, all of, you know, not all of, I shot almost 30,000 photos, so I, you know, so a bunch of the photos, a bunch of the writing, and then all the, the artwork that we did post trip about it. And uh, so that's in the works. And then uh, Kazra Ganbari and I, Kazra is uh, working with Bill Cox uh, of comic art fans. Uh, and they they put on that OAX show, which was you know awesome. Everybody it was a, it was amazing. And but Kazra and I have been working on. He's uh, sort of working with me on these books, and um, we're also working on a collection of all my short sequential work. So to kind of gather together all the the heavy metal stuff, the the little frontis pieces I did for Eclipse, and you know various things. And then there's also a, several stories that have never been published that'll be in there along with pinups and all that stuff which both will i think be like kickstarters and hopefully that'll finally lead to you know finally getting my blues book out that has been sitting on a shelf forever you know um still you know i finally gave up just kind of looking for a publisher and uh, we're going to do it ourselves and um, and we'll maybe package it with the, the documentary that we shot that, I, you know, was that I helped uh, put together back when mm-hmm. about how I put these things together in the in the search for the old blues man and the reference and stuff, which we we won best feature documentary that year at the New York International Independent Film Festival. Nice, um, nice. And so. Finally, maybe have it come out along with the Holocaust material, and yeah, you know, I have all these projects that they've never come out. You know, so hopefully they'll they'll see the light of day. Yeah, so. certainly, I certainly hope so. And it's exciting that that things are in the way and in development. Yeah, so we'll see. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, well, George, thank you for the time. Thank you for talking okay. with me. Anything that you want to mention before we close? Anything that we've missed? Um, no, just, you know, you hear it from a lot of people, but, uh, support the artists, <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Absolutely. Uh, you know, I, people are so into like Pandora and this and that and whatever. And it's like, that doesn't help artists, you know, uh, so support the artists, try and buy directly from artists that, that helps everybody out and helps them produce the things that you, that you like, you know, so. absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. Well, well, thank you again. Thanks for thank a wonderful you. talk. Glad to have you back anytime to talk about other projects as they come to be. Cool. Thank you for having me. I, I appreciate it. My pleasure. My pleasure. Anytime.